I was the kid that had to run around the track with a trash bag on his body. You know, they'd cut some holes in it so I could put my arms through it because they were trying to help me keep my weight down. I had tried low fat dieting and trying to cut out all the things that they told me. All of my life I was trying to cut these things out and I was at a Taco Bell drive through and I was 302 pounds at the time. When I saw my reflection in the mirror as I was about to place my order for a Taco Bell order, I said, you gotta do something. And I didn't place the order. I left and started to figure out what I was gonna do. I started watching Jordan Peterson. Then one day I saw him on Joe Rogan's show. And Joe Rogan said, I wanna get into this, cause this is a, I think this is a fascinating thing with you personally, that your diet, um, you're on this carnivore diet yes. now. And I was like, what? Wait a minute. All beef diet. I'm going to try this for six weeks. So here I am a thousand days later. It's, it's, uh, it's definitely been a change. What were your results in the first 30 days that you saw from just eating meat? Within the first 30 days, I stopped taking my blood pressure medicine. So let's talk about the one thing I'm sure that everybody is wondering about. Your blood work results cholesterol, kidney function, we're gonna talk about everything. Just a quick one, we have brand new updates to the ultimate four week fat loss course, including brand new meal plans every single week to help you lose weight and have more energy on a carnivore lifestyle. So if you'd like to check out all the brand new updates, there is a clickable link in the description of this video with 20% off just for you. And if you got any value out of this interview, please feel free to hit that subscribe button. Dante, welcome. Thank you, Rena. It's good to be back. From all the carnivores that I've ever met, I think that you're probably the most inspirational carnivore ever because you have had incredible results from just eating meat for 1,000 days. It's quite incredible, just meat, nothing else. So today, Dante and I are gonna talk about his amazing transformation. We're also gonna talk about his results, including his blood work results, because I know many people, they are concerned about blood work, cholesterol, and all the rest of it. So we're gonna talk about that and his amazing transformation. But before we get into all that, Dante, I would love to know, what was life for you like before you started Carnival? Oh, okay, I gotta go back to that time period. <laughs> Well, you know, all my life when I was younger, it was a struggle just just trying to stay a little bit trim or in shape. I mean, I can remember all the way back to second grade playing football, and I was the kid that had to run around the track with a trash bag on his body. You know, they'd cut some holes in it so I could put my arms through it because they were trying to help me keep my weight down. And... I didn't know what these struggles were for or why or, you know, anything about eating food. My, I just ate whatever my mother gave me and went on with that and struggles all through school years and trying to lose a little weight, trying to lose a little weight. So that was always a problem up until about 12th grade when I really started getting more active. I joined the wrestling team and I started exercising regularly. When I started the wrestling team, I was 210 pounds. And when you wrestle in at least amateur wrestling in the United States back then, the weight classes stopped at 189 and anything over 189 was heavyweight. And heavyweight could go all the way up to 275. And the problem was, is that when you had to wrestle people that were 275, if you're 210, that 65 pound weight advantage could be a tough dis you know, disadvantage to overcome. So I, I worked hard in my senior year just to get down to 189 pounds. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. I, I feel much better this way. And then I I was always a fan of things like Sylvester Stallone and of course Lou Ferrigno, because you know, I, I was told by my aunt years ago I was related to him, but I've spoken to him since then. But the first thing out of his mouth when he meets anybody named Ferrigno is there's no relation. So <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't really care anymore because if his attitude is that way, I'm like, oh, what difference does it make? But um, I had that idea that, you know, I've got the genetics for bodybuilding and I wanted to get into that, but I just didn't have the discipline. I didn't have the discipline when I was younger to do something like that. I was exercising a lot, but I just didn't stick with it. 
And then, of course, life kicks in, and I started working, started making good money in sales, and that slows you down. That's a bit of a sedentary life a lot of times because you do a lot of standing, you do a lot of sitting, but you don't do a lot of moving, and you wind up eating a lot of fast food and eating out. And Then I got married young, had children young. I was in my early 20s. Shortly after that, I, I even became a manager. I was 23 years old when I became a manager at the company I was working at. I was the youngest manager in the company, but that just meant more time sitting in the chair. <laughs> <laughs> more office work, more standing around. And between that and settling into the the happiness of being married, especially early on, you know, you, they say you tend to get fat and happy. Well, I was already there. So I was just getting more and more along that path. And as time went on, I adjusted to having 230, 240 pounds on my body, 250 pounds on my body. And I had tried low fat dieting and trying to cut out all the things that they told me. All of my life I was trying to cut these things out. I was drinking milk and drinking uh, orange juice and juicing and eating salads and doing everything I could to try to stay in shape. But it seemed like nothing ever worked and I couldn't understand why. Uh, if I starved myself plenty by doing those things, then it tended to lose a little bit of weight, but then I would get hungry again and start eating and it would just come right back on. And I stayed in sales until, I don't know, let's see, I was in my mid thirties. I think I was in some kind of sales type of thing, maybe even earlier than that. Yeah, it was earlier than that. But I remember going to, uh, I was working at circuit city at the time. I was an electronic salesman there and I was at a Taco Bell drive through and I was 302 pounds at the time. 302 pounds yeah. what happened to 250 you got to 302 pounds it just keeps going you know I, by then i i wasn't I, I think i had lost hope in a lot of the diets because i had been i lived in south texas at the time and everybody eats taquitos and burrito uh, breakfast burritos and things like that and I got to where I was having them with all the stuff that goes inside of them and all that flour and all the other things that you, you wind up eating, sour cream. And I don't know if sour cream is necessarily bad, but I haven't had any since I've been doing this. But And I, I, was a, I was always a sweet lover. It was hard for me to get away from sweets. So if there was time for some cheesecake or, or candy or all kind of things like that. So those things worked their way back into my life. And... When I saw my reflection in the mirror as I was about to place my order for a Taco Bell order, I said, you got to do something. And I didn't place the order. I left and started to figure out what I was going to do because I remember I was there was a manager, there was a district manager at Circuit City at the time who used to come in and he was a heavy guy. But then six weeks before, or I don't know how many more than that. I mean, he would come around about every six weeks, but like three visits previous, I noticed he looked a little smaller. And then the next visit, he looked a little smaller. And the next visit, he looked a little smaller. And I asked him about what he was doing. And he told me about a book by Dr. Atkins called The Atkins Diet Revolution. So I read that book and started taking some advice about eating meat, things that they weren't telling me to do in all the years that I had been trying to get in shape and cutting out things that I was I thought I was supposed to be eating. Now, some of the things I ate on Atkins diet that I don't eat now, like I would have a bowl of spinach with some ranch dressing back then. I would try to keep it to green vegetables because, you know, he talks about that in the book, all these reasons why these things help or whatever. And that's why I'm always careful to say if somebody's got a specific plan for how you're going to get in shape, it's not always the right way, but... I was eating so much meat on Atkins diet and so much less of the other stuff. And I was avoiding sugar. I was avoiding the things that we find out on carnivore that cause us problems. I don't know that I was avoiding seed oils, but I wasn't using them to cook my meats. So I'm sure there were some in there because I did a lot of eating out. I would go to a local steakhouse that had a, a buffet type of thing. And you could load up on their, their meat at $5 a pound. And I was getting sirloin steaks every day. So I wound up getting down to two, uh, 200 and, 
I think it was 214 at the lowest when I did Atkins diet. Really? That, so whoa, I whoa, wait, let's, whoa, whoa. <laughs> that is 100 pounds by eating yeah. more and it's meat. I mean, Atkins, and it's so interesting. So many people follow the same journey. I hear people that are doing the vegetarian, vegan, paleo, keto, the low fat. They've tried everything. And then they find Atkins and they say, that really worked. But you mentioned the seed oils. You mentioned the vegetables. So I think that as we're finding with carnivore, it's that next level up. It's the, yeah. it, it, it really is so powerful to get that next level up without eating, with, without tracking calories and eating less, without that restriction. I just want to say that was amazing. A hundred pounds just from doing Atkins. Incredible. Yeah. Actually, it was 88 pounds in six months. I, I mean, I did it from the end of December to, uh, I forget, I think it was sometime in May. But I remember it was six months and I had lost 88 pounds. I went from a size 30, uh, size 42 pants to size 32 and <laughs> I mean, that's 25% of my circumference was gone. That was amazing. I didn't, and I hadn't been in 32 pants probably since I was in 12th grade when I was on the wrestling team. So I was pretty happy about that. And, and I kind of kept it in that 220s range for a little while. And the thing is, is I didn't make a lifestyle change with that. I didn't say this is just going to be it. Once I started to get comfortable with my body again and uh, live in life, I decided to have a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And some of the things started creeping back in. And then eventually it's just when you don't make a lifestyle change, that stuff comes right back. But even then, even when I lost that weight, I didn't feel like I do now. It, it didn't, I didn't know what the difference was because I didn't know anything about it being different. I was so happy about losing that weight. It made such a big difference. But I wound up putting the weight back on, especially when I got remarried. And we got fat and happy again. And my wife loves to make like pasta and all kinds. Of, and she's, she's a, a pleaser when it comes to making food. She wants to see, here, this is going to make you happy. This is going to make you... You know, she's good at like giving those things that are going to make you feel good or whatever. And I would eat it up. I'm not blaming my wife now. Don't get me wrong. But uh, it, it definitely was a lot easier, especially with her making those things. And then I started working as an administrator. I, I, I didn't switch right from sales to this, but I mean, there was some stuff in between. But I started, I became the administrator at a retirement home. And again, I'm sitting in an office. I'm on my butt a lot of times. And I was eating whatever either she was giving me. But a lot of times I found myself going to Hardee's and I would get a low carb burger, but I would have it with the lettuce and the tomato and the all the stuff that goes with it. I would have mayonnaise because I remember from Atkins that mayonnaise was okay on Atkins. So there's the seed oil for you because soy is all inside of mayonnaise. Uh, and I, I didn't understand why I was still gaining weight, even though I was trying to restrict some things. I started telling her, okay, I got to lay off on some of the pasta and I got to lay off some of these other things. But those were, those were just fleeting thoughts. And then I would wind up having some more again eventually. So I felt like I was trying to restrict some of the stuff that I was doing, but I was still getting up there. And I remember the one of the times I checked my weight again just before starting this, I was up to 289 pounds at one time. And I thought, man, this is just, I can't understand why this just, I can't win this battle no matter what. Not that I was really putting a whole lot of effort into it, but I was putting what I thought was a fair amount of effort. I was eating maybe twice a day. I was trying to keep it low carb when I could, but... I was still eating the standard American diet ultimately is what it comes down to. And I was squeezing in meals when I could, so I would eat whatever was available. And it wasn't the weight though this time. The first time it was about weight loss. One of the things that started to happen, and I think this has a lot to do with what, what went on in 2020, where we all started feeling a lot of pressure from the pandemic and everything that was going on. Plus, being the administrator at a retirement home, that was a whole lot more pressure on keeping the virus from affecting my residents. And we were just constantly being diligent on keeping things clean. And 
Then on top of that were all the changes from the regulatory agencies. And the problem when you run a place like that is it seems like the government is running your business and you just work for them. Even though it's your business or you're the main person in charge, you re really don't have a whole lot of control over decisions. And when you're struggling financially like we were, because it was a, a small country retirement home, it was a lot of stress. Ultimately, it was a lot of stress. And 2020 took that stress over the top. And I was already starting to see some you know, some changes in my attitude, my my general emotional state was much stronger. I also drank a, a pretty good bit. I mean, I wasn't a go out and party kind of guy. I was more of a come home and have a glass of bourbon, maybe a second glass of bourbon. The problem with that second glass is it leads to two or three and you don't even think about it after that. But I was going through probably a, a 1.75 liter thing of bourbon every week. And that was to, to deal with the stress and the anxiety and things like that. I think a lot of those things wind up just bottling that stress and it doesn't actually let you have a release from it. It just gives you a temporary break from it. And then when you're not drinking or having something like that, then it just comes back even harder. And it was starting to affect my attitude to the point that even my wife was like, gosh, I, I can't even be around you anymore. You're, you're just difficult to be around. And I was always this, you know, I'm like go getter type of guy. I wanted to be able to do things and achieve things and make the home the best place it could be and do good things for the people and make sure that it was a healthy, happy place to be. But when you're trying to bring that much order in, sometimes you can easily become a tyrant. And I think I was kind of letting that bleed into my marriage some, and it was putting a lot of pressure on us. And that was causing me more stress, just knowing that I was having a hard time in my relationship with my wife. And I, I, I don't know that this is specifically what caused the problem because doctors were never able to tell me anything. But ultimately throughout about 2019 to 2020, I had this pain in my gut area and it was just getting worse and worse and worse and the doctors had no answers for anything they didn't know that i mean they they would scope up one end and scope down the other they would looking at everything inside of me and saying there's nothing wrong we can't find anything wrong with you and one of the other things i was trying to do to relieve some of the stress or at least get my my mental attitude right aside from my my faith studies was I, I started watching Jordan Peterson. I'd been hearing this name around for the longest time. I'm like, who is this Jordan Peterson I keep hearing about? So I clicked on one of his videos on YouTube. I was instantly hooked. I was like, this guy, he's articulate. He's, he's, he's genius. And he's a, you know, he's a psychotherapist. I guess no, not a psychotherapist. What he is, a clinical psychologist clinical psychologist, and he was a professor up in Toronto at the time, and he was just sharing his lectures online, and most of it deals with taking on responsibility and basically the things you're supposed to do in life, and I, was all, I thought I was already taking on certain responsibilities, but I started to recognize areas where I was lacking in the follow through in my daily life, in my, the small things, I was taking care of the big things I was providing for my family and I was struggling with that, but it was taking care of myself where the problem was. And I was getting a lot of benefit from watching his, his channel or the videos on his channel that were just motivating me to make these small changes. But I hadn't gotten to that point yet where I was really doing a whole lot with it. But I was I was watching and I was learning. And then one day I saw him on Joe Rogan's show. And Joe Rogan said, so are you still doing that all beef diet? And I was like, what? Wait a minute. All beef diet? Dr. Atkins said, you got to have some greens. You got to have some of these other things along with it. But it was a lot of meat. But I didn't think it was possible to do an all meat diet. Because I remember back when I did the Atkins diet, I was pounding vitamins like crazy. I had to take several, like two of the regular one a day multivitamins. And then I was having a whole bunch of vitamins to go along with that. And I remember I skipped like three or four days without taking those vitamins. And one day I was just dead. I didn't have any energy. I didn't have any strength. And I thought, well, that's the key. You got to keep taking those vitamins. Because at the time I didn't know meat was loaded with nutrients like I do now. 
So when I heard him talk about this all beef diet, the first, once I got over the shock of realizing that that's all he eats, which is specifically ruminant meats, but I mean, beef was his, you know, the, the focus. I started listening to what he had had healed by that, the things that had changed for him, the things like getting rid of uh, a gum disease that's usually related to heart disease. He had this numb spot on his leg that had been there for years that just went away and that he had uh, his vision got better. His, uh, uh, I don't know if he, he was on SSRIs. I remember that. He was, uh, he, he was struggled with chronic depression in his family and he thought it was more of a genetic thing and it, it could be partially genetic, but it was clear that diet was changing that because he was able to get past all of those things. And on top of that, he had lost a bunch of weight too, so he felt better than he'd ever felt. So I started looking a little further and then I saw that his daughter Michaela was the one who turned him on to it because she was basically searching to save her life. She was dealing with this problem that was basically, I think, called juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. And she had had multiple surgeries. They were at the point they were about to fuse her feet to her legs. And she said, this is, this is just no way to live in constant pain. And she had the SSRI problem and all those things too. So I could relate to the pains that she was having. I could relate to the, the, the depression issues that they were facing. And I, I didn't want to take medicine for those things. So I thought, who knows? If it can heal all of these things that were happening for them, then maybe it could help my problem because doctors sure weren't helping me with anything. So I said, you know what? I'm going to do this. And at the time, I had a, a YouTube channel that I was doing. Uh, I started with my son because he wanted to share his video gaming stuff online. And I thought, well, I don't know about you just sharing stuff with the world because he was a young kid at the time. He's 16 now, so this was he was 13 then. And I said, well, you, first of all, you got to be a certain age, I think, to broadcast your stuff on YouTube. But also, I want you to be careful because you're putting stuff out there that's going to be out there forever. And these things could come back to bite you. So I said, rather than don't do it, I said, let's do it together because I was into gaming. I like playing video games and stuff like that. And I thought, well, well, we'll do that. And I had a small little audience. I was doing a golf clash gaming thing where I would just play golf on an iPad. And somehow that was a big deal, but it was a lot of fun at the time. And it was fun learning how to do YouTube. So I'd been doing that for about a year before I started doing Lion Diet. So when I started doing Lion Diet, I thought, hmm, I know there's a lot of guys in the community that are, you know, struggling with weight issues because, you know, gaming is a sedentary activity. And I thought, well, I'll make a video about this because I knew from my experience on Atkins that if I go with a lot of meat in my diet, I'm going to lose weight. And I think it's going to be pretty profound and it might make some changes for people and it might motivate some people to be able to get started, you know, getting healthy again. I didn't know what else to expect from it other than the fact that I knew I was going to get a few pounds off and I knew that maybe I could have some healing for the situation I was dealing with. So let's first talk about your results in the first 30 days of starting Carnival. And I know that you were just eating ruminant meat. So that's lion diet. And we're going to talk about the mm -hmm. differences and why Dante chose lion diet. What were your results in the first 30 days that you saw from just eating meat? First 30 days. One thing that was interesting is that I got satiated very quickly. I didn't feel like I was hungry. And I know that's not necessarily a result, but it is a big thing when you're trying to do something that any, anywhere you're restricting what you're putting in your body, not being hungry was a huge benefit because if you go around hungry all the time, you're going to eat the wrong things. And then also a lot of people, they haven't been able to train their body to know the difference or their mind to know the difference between hunger and cravings. And cravings are always going to be a big issue when you're getting off of a lot of sugars and things like that. So the first thing I noticed was that I was able to, to eat and be satisfied very quickly. I started to notice that I felt better mentally very quickly. Because I was, I, I know I had a lot of seed oils in my food because we used to use Pam and Vegeline and all those different sprays on our, on our cookware when we would cook things. I know that the, the cook at the retirement home used Vegeline on everything she cooked with. So I was getting all that seed oil out of my system. And it was, it was like 
within three days at least, I felt like a different person. I was still having pains, but I wasn't. And of course, I was going through the keto flu situation, but that was much better than what I was experiencing before. And there's there's more to the before part. I mean, I I was having such bad constipation before I started doing this diet that I would sit in a bathtub for an hour to soak almost every morning, putting Epsom salt in there, just trying to get something moving. And it was terrible. It was awful. So just being able to go to the bathroom at all was was, was happy for me. I mean, keto flu, or as they call it, keto flu was not a disaster for me. It was nice to be able to get something happening. And one of the things that I was doing to make sure that I, I was successful on this is I decided I'm going to make a lot of meat at one time so I always have something available. Because if I did get a craving or I did actually get hungry, I wanted to have something ready to go. Because I had known from my experience on on Atkins diet that it's a process making meat a lot of times. Or, you know, I didn't have access to that same restaurant that used to provide steaks for $5 a pound. So I had to make it myself. So I figured I would just make a lot of it at one time. And that helped out a lot. I think that was a big part for getting over the hump. And then adding salt was an unusual thing too. But I think that had a big part for the energy that I started to feel. I started to feel more motivated to get up and get started. And then within, I I know within the first four months, I started having so much energy that I started exercising. Well, and also prior to my diet, my sleep was terrible. I couldn't get to sleep at night. All the things on my mind were always there. So I would wind up laying there looking at the ceiling or looking at the back of my eyelids trying to go to sleep. And then I'm check my watch. Okay, it's two in the morning. It's three in the morning. I'm still awake. It's four in the morning. I got to be at work at nine. And it's just it was awful because every morning was dragging out of bed and not being able to get started right and then having to deal with the bathroom problems. And, but within a very short period of time, I found that I was sleeping better. I don't remember exactly when, I mean, cause going back three years is not the easiest thing, but I would, I would be able to go to bed at midnight and then I was springing out of bed at four 30 in the morning, ready to go. I had so much energy. And I think the salt had a lot to do do with that because both sodium and chloride are electrolytes. And I had been restricting salt most of my life. That's another thing doctors were telling me all the time is that you got high blood pressure. I didn't mention that before. I had high blood pressure as well. So they were telling me to cut back on the salt. So, I mean, I was kind of taking a risk even just doing this. But I said, the doctors aren't giving me anything. I'm going to give it a try. And I started having that energy. I started being able to to get by with a very small amount of sleep. And I think a lot of that, because I I sleep more now, I think a lot of that has to do with your body adapting to things and losing all that extra fat and just being able to to function properly. Not to mention, I'm 10 times more active now than I was when, you know, prior to this diet. So eventually the sleep did catch up, but it was so amazing. I had always wanted to be able to get a little bit of sleep and then get a lot more done during the day. So I got real excited about that. So there was just little things were building up and it was making it seem like this is, this is beautiful. This is wonderful. I mean, just nothing about this that I can say is bad. I was still dealing with the same stresses and things at work, but I was finding that I was happier again. I have to ask, with all the benefits that you've seen, so the first month and even the first six months, your sleep improved, energy improved. You had a little bit less pain, is that right? Yes, yes. It started to it started to go away very quickly as far as my gut responding badly because I wasn't putting the things in there that were causing the problems. Uh, I think fiber was affecting me because I had had a surgery done. They took my gallbladder out back in 2002 which I think now is related to all that low fat dieting I was doing because I was starving my body of fat and thinking that was gonna make me healthy. Well, my bile was just sitting there with nothing to process and the body wasn't being told to release bile to deal with this fat. So that caused the stones, they took that out. And back in 02, they were into putting the mesh into people's body to seal up the, the, I I don't know in uh, what all different cases they use it in, But in this case, it was the abdominal wall that they cut through 
in, right, right above the belly button to go through to get the gallbladder out laparoscopically. So they put a mesh in there to, to give it some support. Well, since then, I found out those meshes are a medical nightmare, especially if you have a problem. And my mesh ruptured or something. I don't know exactly what happened, but I know about three or four years after I got the... Uh, yeah, it was four years or five years later. I got after I had the mesh put in, I started to notice this, this little like felt like a snake moving in my my belly button area, and I said, "What is that? What is going on?" And it turned out that the my intestines were poking through the abdominal wall into where the fat stores are, and I could feel the movement in my intestines on the outside, and uh, I had to have that fixed. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it was rough. Uh, so I went to the doctor and I said, I don't know what's going on. They said they got to repair the mesh. And so I thought that was what they did. And the reason I say I thought is since then I've had it, a CT scan done and they say they can't even find the mesh. So I don't know what they did when they went in there. But whatever they did, that that I think exacerbated some pain too. Because that was right where the location was where I would have the pains that I was always having. So getting out the, the seed oils, I think, were a big part because that was causing what I now believe was leaky gut and causing those, those things to leak through that cause you to have those autoimmune responses and those gut problems that you might have. And then also the fiber. So getting those two things out were huge for my gut health. Getting the, the fiber out, getting the seed oils out was making it easier to, to live. And I was going to the bathroom more normally within a very short period of time. I think I was on the keto flu for maybe six weeks, but I don't remember exactly, but it wasn't very long. I was surprised at that because when I did Atkins, I had it for the entire six months. It never went away. So when you did Atkins, you had lost 88 pounds. So I know you had so many benefits on carnival or lion diet. How much weight, because people, they want to know this. They come to Carnival for the healing and also for the weight loss. How much weight did you lose in the first 30 days and the first six months? I actually didn't even weigh myself before I started. And I didn't start tracking my weight until two weeks in because I wasn't focused on weight so much. I figured it would be obvious in my appearance changes for the video purposes, but I was really, I was still in a bad place mentally when I started you know, the, the emotionally and with the stress and everything, I was really just, I mean, I was at the point, the depression was bad. We'll just say that. I don't want to, you know, go into too much depth on that because I'm glad I'm not in that place anymore. But I was just clinging to life those first couple of weeks where I was glad to to see that I was getting some results right away. But when I started, I didn't have any hopes that this was going to, I didn't have any real thoughts that this was going to change the problems I was having. I just knew I was going to lose some weight. And I even in my first video, I said, I'm going to try this for six weeks. So here I am a thousand days later. It's, it's, uh, it's definitely been a change. But I know I was around 280 when I started. So I just kind of guesstimated and said 275 when I started. And I don't remember exactly within 30 days, but I know a lot of my viewers have watched my channel and they'll tell me you lost 30 or 40 pounds in two months. Ultimately, I got from wherever I was around 275, 280 down to 214 pounds in 125 days. And that was the same weight that I had gotten down to on Atkins diet in six months. That even though it's not the same amount of weight loss, I was excited. I was like, man, I'm right back to where I left off when I when I got on this this way of a similar way of eating years ago. So that was exciting. But what's most important is that you've maintained the weight loss. You've maintained for three years. It's not just six months. It's not just, you know, less than a year. You have maintained it. This is your life now. And I think that's what people want. They want something that's not just a diet, not just something that they can just start and finish and then, you know, back yep. to your regular lifestyle. Because with Atkins, you said that things started to creep in. So the question I think many people would want to know, including myself, is how do you maintain consistency just doing the lion diet? Because lion diet is just ruminant meats. It's not even broad like carnival. It is just ruminant meat. 
What makes you so consistent with that lifestyle now? Well, there's a few factors. Uh, preparation is a big one. Like I said in the beginning, I was making a lot of meat, so I would always have it ready. Um, within those first 125 days, I did discover the air fryer, which made it a lot easier to make a steak in a very short amount of time. I think on average, it took me about 13 to 14 minutes to make a steak the way I wanted it. And I said, I can wait 15 minutes to eat if I'm hungry. So that, that was fantastic. And I stopped having to make all my food up front. And I didn't like it. The one thing I didn't like about making food up front is hamburger meat doesn't do well reheated usually. Although I found a trick for that recently too. Oh, but, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I talked about it in a recent video. I keep a crock pot going almost all the time now with something in it. And whenever I've got some hamburger meat I want to reheat, I just drop it in there and that the, all the fat that's in there because it'll be you know this high with liquid. And that'll get it juicy and warm again without having to microwave it and get it all dried out when you try to choke down a, a hamburger that's been reheated. It's not very comfortable. But it, anyway, um, the air fryer was a big, big change for that because I didn't have to spend time cleaning the grill afterwards when I would go outside and grill. And I didn't have all this splatter everywhere that came from cooking in pans. And even the oven didn't need as much. The air fryer was just real easy to clean. So that made it easier. Let's see, you had asked uh, what made it easy to stay consistent. Well, because... Atkins, and I've seen many people that do Atkins, including Lisa Duncan. She's a three-year carnivore. She's been on my channel as well. She did Atkins, and then you kind of go back to where you were before. I think what, and, and that's the same with keto as well. I think the main thing is that when you allow more things in, it's easier to cheat. But when you allow a little bit of restriction, and restriction is the path to freedom. And I spoke about that with Coach Bronson on a previous video when you have that restriction, it's not restriction, like you're narrowing your life, you're actually giving your body the energy and the nutrients that it needs to thrive. When you allow things that are keto approved or carnival approved, it's very easy for your taste buds to just go off and just think, oh, okay, I can have this and then this and then this and this and this. And then before you know it, you're back to where you were previously. Dr. Anthony Chafee also talks about that with fruit, and we're gonna get into a game a little bit later, talking about different foods. Fruit, you see these foods that are so healthy for us, but everyone is very different. And the way that you're doing it is working for you. In my opinion, it could be because it's that narrow focus. You know what you have to eat. You're making it in the air fryer. It's very quick. You're making the lifestyle work for you. And that's why you've seen, it. that's just my opinion. I could be wrong, maybe I'm wrong. In your opinion, would you think that or is it something different? Well, one of the things is, is I decided I'm not going to take any shortcuts by getting somebody else to prepare my food or buying pre-prepared food because I, I couldn't be in control of what was in the food then. And that was a big part of just having the discipline to make your own food all the time when I wasn't used to cooking. So, I mean, it was, it was a, a learning curve for me to even get to where I could do this on a regular basis. But it didn't take long because once you've done it every day for you know, even a month, that's, you started a habit now. So it makes it a lot easier to move forward. And I was finding easier ways to do it. I wouldn't necessarily call them shortcuts. I mean, the air fryer could be kind of considered a shortcut, but I'm not having anybody else do the work for me. I'm still the one doing the work. And I would plan when I'm going to go out with somebody, I'm going to already be full. I don't want to have to go out to eat somewhere and be tempted to have something they're going to have because I don't know if they're using seed oils. I don't know what they're putting in there as far as seasoning. And early in my diet, those things would affect me very tremendously. And they still do. I'm still sensitive to the stuff that's not on lion diet. And you had asked about why I decided to do lion diet. It was because when I introduce those things back into my body, when I introduce plant materials of any kind, seasonings, vegetables, uh, seed oils, they all have some kind of an effect on me, and it usually comes with digestive discomfort. Uh, it can affect my attitude. I think especially with the seed oils, I, I found out that about six months or no, now it's about nine months ago, I started eating food at a restaurant that I thought wasn't using any seed oils when they cook anything, but they weren't considering that seed oils on the grill 
to keep the grill greased still counted. And I was eating that for about six months. And I started to notice that I was like, Man, why am I struggling with this anxiety again? And I, I really think that the oxidation that comes from seed oils and what it does inside your body and bringing back inflammation, it has a tremendous effect on your attitude because it was starting to, to cause me to have anxiety that I wasn't having again. But um, going back to, to staying consistent with it, it was really about just making sure that I had the food that I needed to eat every day so that I could get through. But it was easy because I found that there were days I wouldn't even be hungry all day. I would wake, I would wake up and go through the day and I would look at the clock and it would be 2 o'clock in the afternoon and I haven't eaten yet. I haven't even thought about eating yet, which was unusual for me prior to that. So that started to make it easier because I was my body was consuming its own fat. Plus, it was eating the I was eating the food and getting all the nutrients I needed. So it's like Dr. Chafee talked about. Once your your stomach starts to tell your your brain through that vagus nerve that oh we got the nutrients we need, you can stop now. So I didn't need to eat as much quantity to feel like I was full because I was getting the nutrients I needed. I think that's the main thing is that you found a way of eating that you enjoyed. It was mm -hmm. easy. Oh, that's, that's, that's a big part. I, I got to definitely point that out. I love eating steaks. So, I mean, there's, I got away from burger pretty early, but I've gotten back to it now that I've, I've been better adapted because when I buy whole cows, I know that I'm getting good quality meat. So I, I, you have to be careful with burgers sometimes because at least here in the United States, some of the, um, some of the places you buy them from will say, natural flavoring or something like that and you don't know what they're putting in there and sometimes they're using seed oils to grease the grinder so you got to be careful with with where you're getting when it comes to burger but steaks oh just wonderful made it easy but that's the thing do what you love if you love steaks mm -hmm. eat them if you love pork or beef burger patties or salmon have it you know have if it works, what you love do it. if it works for you if you can tolerate it have it I also now wanted to talk about something I know that many people really want to know because you've been carnivore a thousand days just eating meat. People want to know, well, what happens to your blood work? What happens to your results in terms of cholesterol and, you know, your vitamins and your, all the rest of it. So now we're going to talk about your blood work results because I'm sure that people are just thinking, well, he must be dying just eating meat, but you're not because they were absolutely shocking. So I have them here. The first thing I wanted to ask you was your kidney function. What happened to your kidney function? Well, just prior to carnivore, my doctor had uh, taken my blood work about six months before that. And I know my EGFR was in the 60s back then. And I don't even know if I knew then or if I found out later. I think I found out later when, it, when he told me my, my kidney function had improved because my first visit afterward, it was in the 70s. And then the next time after that, I think it was in the 80s. So he said, your kidney function is getting better. And I said, was my kidney function bad before? He said, yeah, it was, it was, it was eking down there. It was getting down to a level that I wasn't, you know, terribly comfortable with, but it wasn't bad enough to really put you on any, any medicines at the time. So that was a surprise because one of the things everybody told me, oh, you're going to kill your kidneys eating all that protein. My kidney function started improving immediately, and within the first six months, it was the best it had ever been. And I've had my kidney function checked since then, and also, what's what's that other marker for kidney function? I always forget that it's a longer word. Creatinine clearance? That's it. Uh, that stayed, you know, pretty much the same, which is a good thing because you don't want that going to, you know, adjusting at all because that's the be the best marker for overall kidney function. But my EGFR kept improving, and that the other one stayed the same. So my kidneys have been great. Let's talk about the next one, which is you mentioned that you had elevated blood pressure before. So eating lion diet, just eating meat, lots of saturated fat. What happened to your blood pressure? Well, one of the things is, is I was taking lisinopril every day prior to eating lion diet. And I was starting off still taking the same medicines I was taking. And within the first 30 days, that's a good point. It's so funny how I think of these things after the fact. Within the first 30 days, I stopped taking my blood pressure medicine because my blood pressure was getting so low that I was feeling woozy sometimes. 
So as soon as I stopped taking the blood pressure medicine, then I felt great. And then I saw my doctor, I think it was 60 days in or something like that. And I told him that I hadn't been taking it for 30 days and he had checked my blood pressure when I came in. He said, well, good, you don't need that anymore. So that was that was a quick one. Considering how much salt I was taking in and all the news I'd been told about salt being a blood pressure killer, I was tickled pink to hear that news because I was a little concerned about it. I'd wondered what, what's going to happen, you know, what, what's, what are they going to say when I... When I go in there, is my blood pressure going to be through the roof? No, nope, it was normal. And it's important to preface for, that anybody watching right now, they're on carnivore, doing a lion diet, seek medical advice with your doctor prior to stopping or ceasing any medications because you do need to make sure that your markers are at the right stage and that you're under medical supervision before you start changing anything. And these results that Dante is experiencing is to do with his individual results. Not to say that you know, you or somebody else might have exactly the same results or at the same speed. But it just goes to show how incredible eating meat, taking out all the rubbish is on your health and that immediate benefit on your blood pressure, on your energy, on your sleep from taking out everything and just purely eating nutrient dense foods. Just incredible. I will say here that I think, I think there are a lot of doctors who really do care about their patients and are wanting to bring them to a healthier lifestyle. But the focus of the medical industry right now doesn't seem to be fostering uh, a situation where they can do what they would really like to do because it's more about prescribing medicine. And I, I've learned to take my blood work numbers with a grain of salt, you know, <laughs> grain of salt. Uh, because th there's so much flexibility. When I would ask, when I start, I'd never thought about my blood work numbers before this. And when I would talk to my doctor about what these numbers mean, it was always kind of mushy. His answers were, there was nothing really specific that he could say like, oh yeah, if it was here, it would be perfect. And if it's there, it's terrible. Or, you know, it's different for everybody. And there was all, and I started to think, well, what is this? What are what are you tracking if if it doesn't really mean anything? And I started to have a little bit of doubts about it, but I still think that there are good doctors out there and it is good to have one that's that's keeping an eye on your blood work, but try to find somebody who's not just following the system. Somebody who actually has done some research and especially has looked at a lot of these more recent studies where people are doing carnivore. I mean, I've, I've heard Dr. Chafee talk about them. I've heard Dr. Baker talk about them. I've heard Dr. Barry talk about them. There are tons of studies out there that are being done that are involving hundreds and sometimes thousands of people, not to mention all the individual study, you know, individual uh, anecdotal, I guess you could say, evidence if you take them one at a time. But when you've got a thousand people out there talking about how their, their lives have changed, and yes, their blood work numbers don't always match what their doctors wanted, but they feel good and they're healthy and they're losing weight and they're not getting sick. And isn't that the end result we're looking for when we're going to see a doctor? We don't want to be sick. <laughs> and that's been the, the key change is that I, I used to be very prone to get ill. Recently, we had a, my son came home from school and he was coughing and you know showing some of the signs of things that we get worried about these days. He got the test and said there was nothing there. I still don't even know if that means anything. But he was sick. Then the next day, my older son had a, a some sort of like a flu bug type of response. And then my wife started to get a little ill. I never got sick the entire time. I used to be the first one. As soon as, as, soon as one of them got sick, I would be sick. And then we would trade it around for a couple of weeks. But now I, my, my immune system is definitely a lot stronger than it used to be. So not getting sick, not being sick is, is what it's all about. And even though the blood work is great, I just, I want to be healthy and I want to feel good because uh, being in a retirement home administrator, I've seen what it's like when you don't take care of your body and then you got to go get somebody to help you take care of yourself. It, it, it can be an awful existence. And it doesn't have to be. And I know that now. And that's why I keep talking about it with so many people is your life doesn't have to be the terrible existence that it is. You know, life is full of tragedy and disappointment and difficulties and challenges. 
but it doesn't have to be miserable by having an unhealthy body and an unhealthy mind. And that's what, you know, this diet has done for me. And you mentioned the blood work with the cholesterol numbers. I was still, I wanted to be able to come back and say that my numbers were, were perfect. And I remember one of my first cholesterol visits, my LDL was technically high. It was like 110. But I found out since then, some people have a lot higher numbers. Yeah, you got the numbers there. You can t- you can mention that. That was very interesting because, and that was probably the most shocking to me, was your cholesterol because you were saying that your LDL was uh, over 100 and then your LDL actually came down to 91. But many people are going to have their LDL tested and it's going to skyrocket. I know for me, my LDL, ours is in, in Australia, ours is in millimoles per liter. I think yours is in milligrams per deciliter. But in any case, my LDL absolutely skyrocketed. And my doctor said to me, if you continue eating this way, we'll have to discuss a statin. I went out crying (laughs) and then I messaged Dr. Chafee. He said, fire her. You know how scary it is when somebody said, like, I am 40 years old having to have have a discussion about a statin. And at that time, I had been trying this diet for less than a year. But anyways, a lot of people they would have an LDL much higher than yours. So, so so that result was quite interesting. What was amazing was your triglycerides. They were already low, but they went to incredible, like 29 milligrams per deciliter. And then you, you, your HDL went even higher, 96 milligrams per deciliter. And I was just like, that's incredible. Like you were just the picture. And every other number for you, and we're going to talk about testosterone, Every number for you improved. And it was, I was just shocked. I was just like, well, Dante is just like the absolute miracle of carnival. (laughs) Well, it's definitely been a miracle for me. I can tell you that not only for my body, but it's, it's given me purpose too, because I love being able to help other people. I love being able to encourage other people to do the things that they need to do because we live in a society. And we've all got to be around one another at some point, whether it's in traffic or at work or something. And if everybody's miserable and sick and unhappy, it just makes it a more awful place to be. And the more people I think that can get healthy and happy, the better it's going to be for all for for us all the way around. And I love it. I love being able to encourage folks. Absolutely. And part of being happy is to have happy hormones. So I wanted for you to talk about your testosterone. Do you, do you know your numbers before carnivore and then during carnivore? Before carnivore, uh, about three years before I started, my numbers were in the low 400 range. And I had been having some performance issues, you know, in the bedroom. So my doctor started me on a, a, a what he told me was a low dose. And from what I understand, it is about the lowest dose you can get of a testosterone injection. I was taking one half of a cc every week. And that was giving me, uh, obviously, more testosterone. But I think it might have also been exacerbating some of my my uh, emotional issues because, you know, th- what they say with testosterone is that if it gets too high sometimes, but I don't know that it was too high, but I don't think it was helping me. But three years before I had been doing that, and even when I started, I was still take, taking my testosterone injections. So when I did some of my early numbers, I was thinking, I'm just taking enough to be normal. I didn't even know what normal was. I didn't know 400 was low. I, when he, I couldn't remember the number at the time. But when I had been doing this for six months, I didn't know anything about these blood work numbers. I just I never looked at this stuff. So when I was seeing my numbers come back and I would report it, I would think, well, that's that's probably close to normal or it's in a high healthy range. And I'm I'm still taking what what would be just the minimal because my doctor said you're just, you're going to need it. You're just you're not going to be able to stop taking this because it's going to go back to where it was or even worse, most likely because I'd been doing it for years because this is what I talked to him about after my first few months was I want to stop all this medicine. I want to stop the testosterone too. And he said, well, I wouldn't do that because most likely your body is not producing testosterone even as well as it was when you started. So you're going to wind up getting a precipitous drop off. And I thought, okay, well, I'll keep taking it then. 
because, you know, if it's just a small amount, then I'll, I'll live with it. And there were times I would even stretch it out instead of doing it every week. I would do it every 10 days because I wanted I wanted so badly just to not have to need this this medicine. But I kept doing it. And for the first year, I was still on testosterone injections, but I was taking them more sparingly. And then things worked out where my doctor wasn't available because I'd moved from Georgia to Florida and I was having a hard time finding a doctor here. I didn't have insurance. Uh, there was so many little blockades that when my medicine ran out, I just wasn't able to get any more. And I was like, okay, well, I guess it is what it is. We'll just see how it goes. And I kept eating lion diet, kept doing everything I was supposed to be doing. I was exercising regularly. I was walking at least three miles a day. I don't remember if I had started rucking by then, but I know I had been doing a lot of exercise and I, I would go to, I was working in a place where I was with my brother-in-law and once a week I would maybe go do CrossFit with him or once every two weeks. So I was adding in some things and I was doing a lot of push-ups and pull-ups and calisthenics. I wasn't doing a lot of heavy weight of any kind. The only thing I really used for weights were dumbbells and I would use those mostly on my, my biceps but uh, mostly just body resistant stuff. And I think that has a, a little bit of an effect because some of the stuff I've watched talks about staying active is good for your testosterone. But according to what my doctor said then and what my new doctor that I had, I had met uh, just before I got my blood work done six months after stopping uh, using testosterone, she said, oh no, it's, you're, you're, it's gonna be lower. But my number was actually slightly higher than it was when I had started testosterone, which gave me hope because that meant that it wasn't going to be in, in the toilet, you know, back down to zero or something like that. I was going to have to start worrying about hormonal issues. So that was exciting. So I pressed on and I think I started exercising even more then, but I, I, cause I think that was when I started using the, the weighted vest. I would wear a I started off with it like at 16 pounds and then I went up to 20 pounds and then 24 pounds and finally I just use it at 40 pounds all the time. And that extra weight and resistance just adds adds more for your body to do plus it makes me feel lighter all day long when I'm done cuz I get my I, I went for a ruck this morning as a matter of fact that's why I'm still wearing my workout outfit. And uh I went and got my, my testosterone checked again. I think it was maybe January or February of last year. Or was it this year? I don't remember. But anyway, it was about six months later. And my testosterone levels were back to a normal range. I don't, you may have the numbers there. Yes. So prior to you were on a testosterone replacement therapy, your testosterone was about 395 on testosterone, on TRT. Your testosterone off TRT and doing lion diet, it went to 585. So that is kind of normal to high. Off any medication, when doctors would tell you, oh, your testosterone's gonna tank, you have no hope. You had the hope, you got your life back, you got your hormones back from just eating nutrient dense foods. But that is so incredible because hormones matter. Hormones is what dictates our energy levels, our sleep, our drive, everything in life. And the fact that your testosterone improves so much without medication, but you are consistent with your diet makes the biggest difference. And the diet really is the key. People, sometimes people want to nitpick and they say, yeah, well, you're clearly exercising. I'm like, yeah, but I'm exercising because of the diet. If it wasn't for the change in the way I was eating, I would never have I would never have found the desire to get up and do the things that I do. Because if I didn't exercise now, if I didn't use this energy that I'm loaded with all the time, I would just be like somebody who drank 10 cups of coffee. You know, I would <laughs> feel like I had all this energy that I had to let go somewhere. And, uh, you know, so exercise kind of is a, is a side effect of once you start getting healthy, you start doing things. And I've got so much more activity in my life now. Even on my job, I usually get three to four miles a day when I'm because I'm a, a waiter that serves uh, in-room dining. So I'm constantly walking, and I'm pushing a cart across the carpet. And then I come home, or you know, before I leave, and I've been trying to do it again. I do the rucks in the morning, 
So, and then I'm working all the time between working at my job and working on my channel. I never would have thought I could get this much done in a day because it just always felt like I just didn't have the energy and I didn't have the desire, but all of that desire and all of that energy was amplified by changing the way I eat. Absolutely. And the one thing that I love to talk about when we talk about carnivore or lion diet, and by the way, let's just quickly talk about the differences between, because Dante is saying he's doing lion diet and then we have carnivore diet. So lion diet is just ruminant meats only. So you think about beef, venison, lamb, any other meats that I'm missing, Dante, that you eat? Beef, venison, lamb, elk, buffalo, bison. Uh, I haven't tried giraffe, but that's on the list. Uh, go I haven't had goats. I have had goat cheese occasionally, but that's, you know, I don't typically do cheese because I don't do well with dairy in general. Well, we're going to talk about some foods in a second. <laughs> um, but that is... Lion diet. So then, and then carnivore is, you do have a lot more variation with carnivore, even though for some carnivore seems very restrictive, right? But you're doing lion diet, which is just the ruminant meat. So now I wanted to go into some 10 very common delicious carnivore foods and get your opinion on these foods for people that are just starting and they're just thinking, well, what should I be eating? Can I have cheese? Can I have a ribeye? Can I have, you know, sardines? If they wanted to have sardines, I don't know many people if they like sardines, but I would love to get your opinion on these foods that I have here. And just in one line, what is it? Is, is it good? Is it bad? And any caution that you have for somebody wanting to eat these foods? How does that sound? Okay. That sounds good, but let me preface it with this. It's going to be case by case different. For some people because the reason why lion diet works so well for me is that I'm much more sensitive to things that are in certain foods and it's not going to be the case for everybody I've seen some people do gangbusters good just doing carnivore eating any animal meat they can get their hands on fish or you know seafood or whatever but for me it might be a little different I'll try to keep it to one line if I can though <laughs> just to keep it quick and snappy <laughs> Let's try. This one is easy. Oh, yeah, definitely easy. Ribeye is king, baby. If I could eat a ribeye every day, I had two ribeyes last night, as a matter of fact, and I was like, ah, oh, I feel so good eating ribeye. And because I have, oh, geez, I'm going way more than one long one. Oh, long don't line. worry. Ribeye is a great fat to protein ratio. And if you're trying to get the energy that you get from fat and the flavor, and then the protein, it's all in one thing. It's like the perfect combination. You don't have to think about adding fat or if it's too lean or anything. Ribeye is king. I love that. And I've seen you make your ribeyes in your air fryer. So if you want to check out how Dante makes his ribeyes in the air fryer and they turn out delicious, I'm going to leave his channel in the description of this video. You have to check out his recipes because it is so good. It's so easy. Next one. Ground beef. Ground beef is, is awesome. You just want to be careful to look at the ingredients on the package because sometimes it's going to have something in there that you you might not appreciate. Artificial or even natural flavors because natural flavors can mean a lot of things. But one of the things that from what I understand, what I've been looking at with the FDA is it can't be it can't mean animal products. If it's an animal product that has to state more specifically what it is. So if it's natural flavorings, it's probably plant related. And if you're on lion diet, that could cause you some problems. If you're not on lion diet and you're not as sensitive to those things, may not be as big a deal for you. I love that you said that because earlier last week when we had our previous conversation, you mentioned the ground beef and then you mentioned natural flavors. And I thought, I like I never actually look at the ingredients on the pack of ground beef. I just assume that it's just beef. Guess what now I'm doing? I'm looking at the ingredients. I'm like, okay, the beef. Okay, just beef. Good. I'm good. There's no, because I'm also very sensitive. Even recently, and we'll talk about it, I'm sensitive to eggs. So it's just crazy. Next food. Bacon. Bacon is great for most people. There's no doubt on a carnivore diet, bacon can be a staple. Pork and I don't get along though. Uh, I think it, you know, it's just, when you're eating the clean meats, when you're eating those ruminating animals that have that multi-chambered stomach that is designed to, they eat vegetables and their bodies can get rid of all of those toxins. It just makes for the cleanest, most healthy meat you can have. I've had pigs before. 
they eat anything they can get into their mouth. And sometimes that includes feces and things like that. So they're, they're a much dirtier animal as far as what they eat. And some people can appreciate this for faith reasons as to why they don't eat pork. But as far as the health side goes, I don't think bacon is a problem for most people. But if you're having gut issues or autoimmune issues, it might be best to leave the bacon behind until you, you know, maybe try to reincorporate it later on and see if it works. I tried to, and it didn't work for me. So Very well said. Uh, I have the same issue with bacon. I have it now as a dessert from time to time. Maybe I might have a little bit of bacon, but it's not something that I have every day. Again, for me, it's the gut issues, which I never knew I had until a few months ago. This one I also have problems with. Curious, you might have problems with as well. Butter. The biggest problem I have with butter is after reincorporating it, I have not been able to restrain myself from it, even though I've noticed some things that weren't good as side effects, like uh, possibly a histamine response. I think it has a lot to do with the fact that my voice sounds hoarse a lot of times, but I haven't had butter in a week and I'm still struggling with that. So I don't know what the deal is. I think it just might be allergies. So, but I've been blaming butter for that for a long time, but I don't know for sure if it's the root of my problem, but I do know I'm sensitive to dairy in general. I tried even milk and I said, I can't do milk. Lactose is awful. And, uh, it, it depends on the person. My wife seems to thrive having butter and I use butter to make their eggs in the morning and things like that. So for anybody on carnivore, I think butter is probably great. But if you want to know if it's really causing you any problems, try without it and then try to add it back and you might be able to see. It's just uh, be careful. It's addictive. <laughs> butter is delicious. <laughs> very addictive it almost like when when you start having butter it kind of tastes like cheese and it can have that association effect and it's not to say don't have any of these foods it's just giving dante's opinion because he's been so successful and had such an amazing transformation and if you want something similar you might be sensitive to certain foods even though they are carnivore and that's why we're having this conversation not to say that something is totally good or totally bad, just to give more insight because as Dante is saying, every single person is different. And even some people, they love raw milk. Raw milk. I haven't had a chance to try raw milk. I was trying to get a hold of some raw milk, but uh, the, the guy who worked for the dairy farm around here uh, never got back to me. So I never figured out where to get any, and it's, I don't even think it's legal here. Some states, it's it's illegal that, to do raw milk, and I don't know why it would be in Florida. This is like the freest state in the country. But um, I wasn't able to try raw milk, but I did try regular milk, and I loved it. Of course I loved it. It had sugar in it, and I was feeding myself my old addiction. That sugar is called lactose. I didn't even put that together. Like I said, I wasn't thinking about these things before, but once I started to draw that comparison, I realized I got to leave milk out. Uh, I would say raw milk might be something that people could experiment with on a carnivore diet, but if you're doing lion diet, it's probably best to leave it alone as well as all other dairy products. Absolutely. The next one is interesting. Eggs. Eggs are one of those ones where it's like, is it dairy or isn't it dairy? It's not dairy because it's poultry. But, you know, again, lion diet, poultry is not part of the diet. Eggs are not something that you would normally eat starting off. I didn't have eggs for the first year and a half that I did this. And then I started to try to bring eggs in because I, around the time I started, uh, I, I did an iodine loading test and saw that I was low on iodine. And I was looking for natural sources of iodine. Well, basically, my research has developed that most of the natural sources are either going to be seafood, uh, sea vegetables like kelp or something like that, or seaweed. And I wasn't going to eat that. And I, I'm allergic to regular fish. And I had gotten to the point where I just don't want to eat the filters of the sea. Like you know, I used to love oysters and things like that. Or at least I think I did. I think I loved eating them and making people that, that couldn't eat them freak out, you know, but, uh, it, it wasn't a flavor that I missed really. If I didn't eat oysters with, with Tabasco and, and horseradish and a cracker under it, then it wasn't good. So if 
obviously it wasn't my favorite thing. So I just never got to where I wanted to eat those things. And the only other way to really get iodine in your diet was either eggs, well, at least from some of the research I've seen, some of it's a little conflicting. And then also uh, if the animals that you're eating are raised close to the sea or the ocean, because the iodine can get into the land and get into the food that they're eating too. And then you get that iodine as well. So uh, I thought I would try eggs to see if that would help with the iodine. Plus it was good for vitamin D. It was another thing I found out I have been a little low on. And that's something that sometimes comes with age as well. Like I say, 48 years I was in this body not treating it the right way. And my skin wasn't synthesizing the sun as well, which is where you get your true vitamin D from. Vitamin D is not technically a vitamin, but it's something that you synthesize in your skin. And mine was getting low. But there are, you know, alternate ways to get it. But I was trying to stick with something that would be natural and I was giving eggs a shot. I think butter and eggs have both caused me to have a bit of a struggle. See, I got down to 176 pounds was my lowest weight on this, this way of eating. And when I started to bring in eggs on a more regular basis and butter was a natural mix with eggs, that was when I put on about, I, I, I got back up to 190 something and I thought, what is going on here? I don't think the eggs and butter are doing it, but what is it? And so I, I even recently, I, I, this for September, as a matter of fact, I have decided I'm just going to cut out butter and eggs and see if I can get this last 10 pounds back off because I liked the way I looked at 176. I never had abs like you saw, you see in my intro video you know, and I, I still, every time I see it, it, it motivates me to stick with it because it, it just feels good. It feels good to finally have the body that I wanted to live in, even though it took me 50 years to figure it out. <laughs> I love it. And eggs and butter, I, they might be causing me a problem. But for most people, for my wife, for my kids, they seem to do well with them. So I make them eggs every morning and I usually give them bacon too, and they're doing great. Absolutely. Some people are more sensitive than others. I am the same. Butter and eggs every day. I actually get eczema, bloating. I don't feel as good as if I just eat just meat and even some salmon. Yeah. Uh, so it's interesting. Everybody is so different. This next food, it's not really a food, but it's like whatever. It's weird. Like, I don't know why people would have this. Protein powder. So even beef, so there is like, um, I, I think it's called prime, uh, sorry, equip beef. It's a collagen beef protein powder. And apart from just maybe getting in more protein, I don't know why somebody would have a protein powder when they can just eat meat or eggs or fish. Yeah. I question that as well. And I, I saw one of the more famous YouTube doctors hawking a protein powder the other day. And I thought, really? Come on. Um, but I think if you're maybe if you're bodybuilding or going for some heavy strength performance type stuff, maybe that might be something worth looking at. But I have no desire to I, I get plenty of protein from the meat. I just I look at when I, when I walk by a GNC store or one of those stores where they sell all those supplements, I think 99% filler, 1% something that might be useful. And like I say, I, I, take, I, take a hand, I take a couple of supplements. I take iodine, I take vitamin D3, and I'm experimenting with some things. I started recently taking DHEA because somebody has suggested that that might help with some things. And I thought, well, I'll give it a shot for you know three months and see if I notice any, any value in it. Uh, so far, nothing, but it's it's been less than a month, so I really can't say if that's been helpful. Um, I've been trying out Keto Chow's uh, electrolyte capsules. I haven't noticed anything. I've been taking those for well over a month now, and I, I use Relight occasionally because I like the way it tastes. I, I take the Redmond Relight, and I put it in either hot water or I'll put it in my club soda or a regular glass of water, and I love it. I think it tastes delicious. I'd rather do that than take pills. So I don't know how the keto chow experiment's going to go. And I don't want to say anything negative because I know the folks over there are doing a good job providing people with the, the supplements that might be helping them. But uh, for the most part, just about everything out there that's in the supplement store, 
I just, I have no interest in, and I don't, I don't really think a lot of times we can't even, um, what is it? We, we don't even absorb a lot of that stuff. We, it's just ex- causes you to have expensive urine is basically what I look at it as because <laughs> you wind up peeing all that stuff right out. But I, I'm not saying that's the case with protein powder, but I just I don't I don't I don't see a need for it unless you're, you know, trying to go for Mr. Universe or something like that. Another thing I don't really see the need for if you can focus on your ruminants and all the nutrient dense foods is this one. Chicken breast. Well, again, on Lion Diet, I, I've not only not eaten chicken, I've not wanted to eat chicken. I've tasted chicken a couple of times, and it's just like, no, no thank you. And chicken breast was never my favorite anyway. When I go back to my low-fat low fat, low fat uh, dieting days, chicken breast is what they always tell you to eat because it was the leaner of the meat. Well, that's what made it dry and, you know, it was like... <sighs> Am I ever going to get through chewing this thing? So I don't, I don't see any value in it, except that, you know, some people are, might want to have some, some chicken in with their carnivore diet. But if, if I were on a carnivore diet, I'd say, give me the dark meat, baby, because that's where the fat is. I also love, and this is where you talk about mixing different foods. So, you know, even if you want to have chicken, because maybe you like the wings, chicken wings are delicious, covered in Parmesan, if you can tolerate the dairy, but you can also pair that with a bit of a ribeye or with your ground beef. It doesn't just have to be a solo meal. One thing I do love having um, is salmon. And the way I love to have salmon, and I know it's weird, but I can just have some ground beef and just a bit of salmon on the side. I, I, I know it's very strange, but I just pair two meats or seafoods together and I'm just in heaven. Well, for people who can eat fish, I have a fish allergy, so I can't eat fish. Oh, really? Yeah. But uh, s- salmon is good because it is a fattier fish. So, I mean, I think that's a good part of it. So you're going to get really good omega-3s and 6 ratio there. Now, the last one, um, this one, obviously, you're not going to eat. And many carnivores, actually, many carnivores are not going to eat it, but they might think about having a little bit in. So let's get your opinion on this one. Fruit. I tried reincorporating fruit. My biggest problem with it initially was quantity control. Uh, When I start bringing sugar back in, I mean, it's like having been an an addict to a heavy drug and you've gotten it out of your system. Well, if you decide you're just going to have a little, that's kind of rough. So what happens is is you, you wind up just overdoing it. At least that was for me. And a lot of people say they have the same struggle is that's where you got to be careful with fruit. But, you know, you got people out there like Dr. Saladino who have reincorporated fruit and he seems to be doing well with it for his his lifestyle. But I think there's some genetic differences there. There's also some being careful with where you're getting the fruit from. Uh, I know he lives in Costa Rica, so he might have access to some really good tropical fruit that's grown at a normal time. You know, fruit used to be available only at certain times of the year. Now it's available year round. And the way they do that is all kind of crossbreeding. They add chemicals to these things. They spray them to make them ripen while they're in transit. And all of this stuff makes that fruit either uh, also genetic modification. It makes the the fruits more uh, pest resistant so that they can grow their crops easier, which means that the toxins that are in there are going to be stronger. The same thing uh, with the uh, crossbreeding. They're trying to make the fruits sweeter. They're, they're bolster, they're, bolstering the sugar content in the fruit to get you to buy more of it. And unfortunately, that extra sugar and fructose, we used to all think that fructose was the best of the sugars. At least that's what they told me since the 80s, is that fructose is the good sugar. But ultimately, fructose, your your whole body can at least process glucose, but only your liver can process fructose. And if you're getting like I had that report before I started this diet that I was starting to show signs of uh, fatty liver disease. And that's from all that fructose, you know, and sodas, high fructose corn syrups and everything. So the problem can be is eating too much of it. And in my case, I just I didn't have any issues eating fruit, which was surprising. But. The biggest problem I had was is I couldn't not get enough of it. And I was afraid it was going to throw me off 
because it would just become a, a staple of the diet. And I didn't want that to happen. So. Absolutely. And I think what's great about you, Dante, is that you've experimented a lot. You've tried different things, but you've found what has worked for you. And I hope that everybody watching this interview will, will get some inspiration to make this lifestyle because I don't like to call it a diet. And I think many people that find a lifestyle that they love, you found something that you love. I have found something that I love, whether it be animal based, lion diet, carnival, whatever the case is, find something that you can be consistent with so that you can do it for the long term and get all the results that Dante has had. And then you can feel so much better, more energy and have a better life like Dante is having. But Dante, if people want to see more of you and hear more about your cooking, air fry, and your wonderful life, where can they find you? Uh, you can find me on YouTube at Ferrigno Freedom. You can also find me on Rumble at Ferrigno Freedom. I'm on Twitter at Dante Ferrigno. I'm on Instagram at Ferrigno Freedom. So I'm, you know, I'm not big on all this social media stuff, but I'm, I'm figuring it out. <laughs> <laughs> you are figuring it out and you need to because you have such an, an amazing story. But Dante, thank you so much for being here. I'm sure many people are going to be so excited to start their lion diet and stick with their carnival journey. But thank you so much for being here and I'm sure we're going to see you very soon. It's always a pleasure, Rena. Thanks for having me. I hope you enjoyed this interview with Dante. Now, if you need more information about a carnival lifestyle, you need to watch this video with Dr. Ken Berry. He explains the 10 ultimate beginner hacks for you to start carnival the right way. I'll see you guys next week.